Have you experienced a pec muscle strain or complete rupture from bench pressing, playing sports, or falling? In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know, including a detailed discussion about surgical versus non-operative management. The pectoralis major is a broad, fan-shaped muscle that consists of two parts, a clavicular head and a sternal head. The clavicular portion originates from the clavicle or collarbone, while the sternal portion originates from the sternum, the costal cartilage of ribs 2 through 6, and part of the abdominal aponeurosis. The sternal portion accounts for 80% of the total muscle volume. The tendons of both the sternal and clavicular heads come together to create a common U-shaped tendon that attaches to the humerus or arm bone. Their primary muscle actions include internal rotation, rotating your arm inward, adduction, bringing your arm down toward your side, and horizontal adduction, bringing your arm toward midline. They also contribute to shoulder flexion and extension. Although injuries to the pectoralis major can occur in women and older individuals, the vast majority of injuries occur in men between the ages of 20 and 40. The most common mechanism of injury is during the eccentric or lowering portion of the bench press. This is followed by injuries from a variety of sporting activities such as rugby, football, wrestling, and gymnastics, which may involve forceful abduction and external rotation of the shoulder. Individuals often report hearing or feeling a popping or tearing sensation at the time of injury. Other common signs and symptoms include pain, bruising, swelling, and a loss of strength. Depending on the severity of the injury, there may be observable or palpable changes in the arm and chest wall. Ultrasound imaging may be used initially to assess a pectoralis major injury, but an MRI is considered the gold standard and is preferred prior to surgical considerations. Tears are typically described using a classification system developed by El Maragi et al. in 2012 that details the timing, location, and extent of the injury. For timing, injuries are classified as either acute or chronic. Acute refers to the tear occurring within the past six weeks. This is an important consideration because when surgery is indicated, most surgeons suggest operating within three to six weeks of the initial injury for optimal outcomes. The timing may also affect the type of surgery that can be performed. For example, acute injuries are usually repaired, which involves reattaching the injured tissues. On the other hand, if the tissue is not repairable, which may occur in chronic cases, a reconstruction using a graft may be performed. With regards to location, tears can be found at the muscle origin, muscle belly, musculotendinous junction, where the muscle and tendon meet, intratendinous region, and at the tendinous insertion, including possible detachment of bone, known as an avulsion. Tears of the muscle are usually managed non-operatively whereas tears involving the tendon or bone are managed surgically. The tendinous and bony injuries occur most commonly. The extent of the injury refers to its severity by describing the width and thickness of the tear. For simplicity and the purpose of this video, the majority of injuries described in the research are complete tears. As written by Thompson et al. in 2020, non-operative treatment is indicated for patients with certain incomplete tears, irreparable damage, for example, muscle belly tears, low demand patients accepting of the cosmetic defect, or those who are unable or unwilling due to medical comorbidities, age, or the ability to comply with a post-operative rehabilitation protocol. On the flip side of that, a paper by McGon et al. in 2021 recommends that early surgical repair should be offered to young active patients with a complete pectoralis major tear. Non-surgical treatment of a complete pectoralis major tear is an option, but will result in a cosmetic deformity and deficit in adduction strength of the injured arm. There are four overlapping phases that occur during post-surgical rehabilitation. The first phase focuses on protecting the newly repaired or reconstructed tissues. Although timelines vary between surgeons based on the extent of the injury and surgery, as well as their experience and preference, individuals can expect to use a sling in some capacity for at least three to four weeks. The second component of rehab focuses on restoring range of motion. Once again, timelines will vary, but passive range of motion is initiated around the two-week mark 
while the sling is still being used on a day-to-day -day basis. Protecting the integrity of the surgery remains the priority, so restrictions or precautions are provided by limiting the degree of allowable shoulder flexion, external rotation, etc. Over time, active assisted and active range of motion are initiated, and full range of motion is expected around the three-month period. The third element of rehab is regaining strength and control of the shoulder and arm. Isometrics of the shoulder, which are muscle contractions that involve no movement, are started around three weeks post-surgery. However, contractions of the pectoralis major are purposely avoided until six weeks or so as protection of the surgical tissues is still important. Strengthening is gradually progressed beyond that and return to most daily activities can be expected around three to four months after surgery. The last phase of rehab focuses on returning to unrestricted activity. This is getting back to playing sports, benching your one rep max, etc. Although some limitations may persist, full function is expected between 6 to 12 months after surgery. With regards to non-operative management in more severe cases, rehab will follow a similar framework, including temporary use of a sling to allow healing of the recently injured tissues. However, as I mentioned earlier, deficits in strength may persist, so long-term resistance training should be a priority. Restoring range of motion will likely be less of a problem. What if you don't fall into either one of these categories? For instance, what if you experienced a low-grade strain of your pectoralis major while working out that doesn't require surgery or use of a sling prior to initiating non-operative rehabilitation? Well, the primary focus revolves around load management and activity modifications. Whether you've strained your pectoralis major bench pressing, sprained your ankle playing sports, or hurt your low back deadlifting, an injured body part is going to have a decreased load-bearing capacity. What this means is that you will have to temporarily scale back movements, exercises, and activities that load the aggravated area. In the case of a strained pectoralis major from bench pressing, you might have to take one to two weeks off from most chest-specific strengthening exercises. Maybe a little less, maybe slightly more. When you do eventually resume push-ups, flat dumbbell presses, etc., it is vital that you carefully manage and adjust the volume, frequency, and intensity of loading. If you strained your pectoralis major from a new training program that had you benching 85 to 100% of your one rep max for multiple sets four times per week, that is not going to be your starting point for rehab. Instead, you'll probably reduce the frequency, you'll definitely reduce the intensity, the total weight on the bar, and you'll likely reduce the overall volume. Additionally, you'll decrease your effort, meaning that you won't take each set as close to failure. It's also very possible that you don't start your rehab with bench press, dips, and dumbbell flies. Rather, you might test the waters with push-ups or flat dumbbell presses. Aside from adjusting your frequency, intensity, and volume of loading, there are other components of exercise that can be modified to predictably lower the demand on your chest and shoulder. Here are four examples. One, exercise selection. I already alluded to this, but you wouldn't try dips prior to doing push-ups. You want to start with exercises that are easier and more controllable. Even if you started with push-ups, you might have to do them with your hands elevated initially. Two, range of motion. All else being equal, a deeper stretch is going to increase the load on the pectoralis major. If you're doing push-ups, you can place a foam roller underneath you to decrease the total range of motion. Similarly, for a barbell bench press or a flat dumbbell press, you can consciously reduce the range of motion, use a physical block to reduce the range of motion, or do something like a floor press. Three, technique. This ties in with range of motion. Using a narrower hand placement during push-ups, bench press, etc. will decrease the total demand on your chest and shoulder. 4. Tempo. It can be helpful to slow things down. You can try a slow tempo, particularly during the eccentric portion of an exercise, or use pauses at the bottom of a movement. This part of rehab is a careful dance as opposed to a perfect science. The dose is and was the poison, but it's also the antidote. You can't completely rest for an extended period of time 
and expect your body to suddenly tolerate the same amount of loads as prior to your injury. Likewise, there's no way of forcing the body to heal faster by doing more than what it's ready for. There's a fine balance between doing too much and doing too little, which we refer to as the Goldilocks Principle. Pain can be a helpful guide during rehab. It's often believed that rehab needs to be completely pain-free, but that's actually rarely the case. A better rule of thumb is to keep your symptoms tolerable during exercise, after exercise, and the following day. If you have a significant increase in symptoms the day after a training session, it just means that you did a little too much and need to scale back as I discussed earlier. Your comfort or confidence can also play a role. If you're unsure if you're ready to add another 5 or 10 pounds to the bar, you might be better off repeating a past performance instead of striving for a new record. Other than directly loading the pectoralis major with chest-specific exercises, is it worthwhile incorporating accessory exercises that train the rest of the shoulder? It might not always be necessary, but it probably doesn't hurt to be as comprehensive as possible. That is exactly what's done during post-surgical rehab. One optional category of exercises that can be performed involves shoulder external rotation strengthening, which is often associated with the rotator cuff. Examples include sideline external rotation, standing external rotation with a cable or band, and external rotation with your elbow on your knee. If you want to progress these exercises, you can perform them in what's known as the 90-90 position, in which the shoulder and elbow are bent to 90 degree angles. If you're standing, use a cable or band. If you're lying on your stomach, use a weight. You'd pick one option to perform slowly within tolerable symptoms for two to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions, two to three times per week. Another optional category is posterior shoulder strengthening in the form of A's, T's, and Y's with or without resistance. These can be done isometrically on the floor or through a full range of motion on an elevated surface or using a cable column. Once again, you'd pick one option for two to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions or 30 to 45 second holds two to three times per week. A third optional category is shoulder internal rotation strengthening. Keep in mind that this directly loads the pectoralis major and therefore may not be suitable to start. The primary option is standing internal rotation with a cable or band. With your elbow bent to 90 degrees and pinned at your side, rotate your arm inward. Slowly control the motion back to the start and repeat. If you want to make it more challenging, perform the movement in the 90-90 position. Like the previous two categories, either exercise can be done for two to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions, two to three times per week. Depending on your symptoms and goals, you may also want to improve your tolerance to different ranges of motion. To work on your overhead range of motion, the best choice is supine shoulder flexion with a dowel. Lie on your back with your knees bent and slowly move your arms overhead as far as comfortable while holding onto a stick, PVC pipe, or broom with both hands. Use as much assistance from your uninvolved side as needed. To increase the intensity, add a light weight to help move the shoulder further overhead. To decrease the intensity, move through less range of motion. To reinforce this range of motion, you could pair this with something like a downward dog or prone shoulder flexion with a dowel. This combination can make for a great warm-up prior to an upper body workout. The number of repetitions may vary based on the speed at which you perform a particular movement. Therefore, it might be helpful to think about accumulating 30 to 60 seconds total per set for two to three sets, two to three times per week. Please understand that all of this information is a generalized framework that needs to be individualized based on your symptoms, function, goals, etc. These exercises may also be applicable to post-surgical cases as well as more severe non-operative cases, but how, when, and why they are applied will vary depending on your doctor's precautions, healing timelines, and other factors. This video is also not all-inclusive. Many individuals will need to work on their shoulder external rotation range of motion, starting at their side and working overhead, as well as improving their ability to reach back into shoulder extension. As always, rehab takes time 
So be patient and consistent. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications, and leave any comments down below. If you are looking for a rehab or performance program or are interested in working with us one-on-one, -on -one, visit our website at e3rehab.com to learn more. Peace.